Hey, everyone, if you love martial arts, anime, or any of those things, or MMA, just make sure to the like, share, subscribe button to the Drew Spiri and show the show that's 80% combat sports and 20% everything else. We're back. We're just focused on YouTube right now, but the audio episodes will be up later in the year. As the focus is to grow the YouTube channel, then go both ways. Today's guest, wow. So we're back. You know, I'm trying to really get the rust off. I don't think I have any rust, but... I mean, that's for you guys to decide, but my guest today is someone I've been wanting to have on for quite a while. We have a mutual friend in Sensei Bob Buchanan in Maryland, USA, and Bob said you got to get this guy on. He's a very interesting guest. He's a man of many talents, a cultured man that's an artist, an author, a very devoted martial artist, father. He's the one, the only, from Philadelphia, the city of Rocky Balboa, Sensei Justin Hagen. Welcome to the show, Justin. Oh, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate you bringing me on board for this. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. I mean, any friend of Bob's is a friend of mine, and Bob was really speaking highly of you. So I had to reach out, and thanks to Bob, we got to do it finally. No, thank you. Bob is great. I mean, it's, he's definitely a great martial artist and a great guy to connect with. Very. Oh, yeah. It's like he's like he's one of the best examples of uh, USA Kyokushin karate because they're so met there because USA is much bigger in population than Canada, but. And there's so many different like Kyokushin like spinoffs. There's so many mm -hmm. uh, different organizations. So Bob's one of the ones that I would say is basically the like the pres like the the statesman of USA Kyokushin with uh, Shian Tom Callahan. That's how how I see those two. Fair enough. Yeah, Bob is always. I mean, even just his training regimens. I've seen him like training in the waterfalls down by his way. He is always really embodying like the true like Kyokushin spirit and like the whole martial art, like subculture of really going out and just kind of embodying what it's all about. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So Justin, you know, um, obviously, you know, I have to ask first, so everything will progress in the shows, you know, but I want to ask, how did you get started in martial arts and then settling on Kyokushin? Cause you've been, you've had quite a journey experimenting until settling. That's true. So actually, I started when I was real young. I was actually about five year five years old. Had an mm -hmm. interest in martial arts, I guess, from TV, whatever was, was going on when I was a little kid. And actually, I started doing ITF Taekwondo, okay. and that was over up in New Jersey, Brielle, New Jersey. And so I did that for about eight or nine years. I did that all throughout my childhood in elementary school, middle school. Ended up with a second degree black belt in there, and it was a lot of fun. It was the man Taekwondo, very kick focused, and ITF Taekwondo was more point. Based though, so it wasn't the intensity of Kyokushin. So it was definitely more of a, again, one of those point based systems. And then by the time I got to high school, I was looking for something a little more intense. And then I found uh, Ishinru Karate. And mm -hmm. so that's when I started training under uh, J.H. Kim over in uh, Wall, New Jersey, when I was in high school. And Ishinru was definitely a lot, I guess, the training regimens was what I was looking for. It was a lot more intense, very, um, yeah, again, what I was kind of looking for at the time. However, unfortunately, even the fighting system for Ishinru was also point-based. I had not been aware that there were actually any other styles outside of boxing, being younger, that was really full contact, and it was something I was always interested in. So, I mean, all throughout high school, I pursued Ishinru, and then I went off to college, and that's when I start, found Muay Thai. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So it was that's why I started doing Muay Thai for a couple of years out in college, and then I started boxing a little bit too, and so I ended up pursuing boxing further than Muay Thai and doing like the Philadelphia Golden Gloves and a couple amateur fights with boxing. And then I was hanging out with a friend one time after college and they were like, oh, did you ever hear of Kyokushin? There was one of our martial arts. I was like, no, what's that? They showed me. I'm like, this exists. Like it was karate like I had done when I was younger. I had like the kickboxing aspects of Muay Thai and the intensity. And it was what I'd really been looking for. And I found it in Kyokushin. So from there, I actually started looking for a place to train. Out, I think 2014 is when I was able to connect with uh, Shihan Roman Herman. He mm -hmm. runs a Kyokushin dojo up in uh, Garfield, New Jersey. And since then, I was training. I would commute from uh, Pennsylvania, drive up to North Jersey, go train with him like whenever I could. He would teach me there. I'd bring it back here, train independently. I started entering some fights. And then eventually, I ended up moving to Shodan, ended up teaching uh, at my dojo now over in Hatfield. I've been doing it ever since. That's awesome, man. Wow, what a journey, especially Ishin Ryu. And it's funny because Ishin Ryu, I don't know if you remember the Sabaki challenges of the 90s that were on TV, but Ishin Ryu did make an appearance. And at the time, that was seen as um, in the U.S. full contact karate because it seems in the U.S., maybe you know this because you're very cultured and you understand. It seems like Kyokushin does 
did does and did so i'm i know my verb my tenses here are not the best right now but it seems like americans saw kyokushin in the past tense say in the 80s and the 90s and then they rebranded it under full contact karate but then there's some who are the purists like yoshi and roman herman and then the others in kyokushin they'll just say no this is kyokushin so and do you think that's what what happened in the 90s because it's really crazy how it's like how you guys have full contact karate and we think it's Kyokushin, but it could just be American full contact karate. Fair enough. Actually, I've always, again, from my own growing up, I was never even really aware of a full contact karate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd I'd see boxing was always very popular in America. Even Muay Thai, I wasn't even really that familiar with growing up. It wasn't common knowledge to the general public. And this was like before the internet really was big. And even when the, before even UFC started exploding. So again, growing up, Full contact karate was something that I wasn't even really aware of mm -hmm. as a thing. And even doing Kyokushin now, there's not many other, I mean, I think there's tons of Kyokushin offshoots that have the full contact that I see. But again, as far as other forms of full contact karate, Kyokushin has been like the forefront of it. And even unfortunately, it's very hard to find Kyokushin schools even in the United States. Hence why I was traveling two, two and a half hours up to North Jersey to train oh. with Shihan Roman. So I would actually, I'm actually the only major Kyokushin school within like the hour to two to three hour range from where I'm at. So it's very hard to even find any other Kyokushin schools that are even relatively close. So actually it's not as popular as it mm -hmm. seems, I guess, over here. I know Canada, there's a quite a few uh, dojos out that way. And actually I was up in uh, Canada in 2017 at Camille, okay. uh, Shion Camille Ohan's tournament. I was competing up that way. So I know it's oh, pretty, okay. pretty popular. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, that's a uh, Shian Camille's uh, big Shin Kyokushin tournament. It's, mm -hmm. uh, but he rec welcomes all. I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's very true when you're in Canada, especially in Quebec. Um, it's be it's like you you could go everywhere and you'll see a karate dojo, and chances are there's gonna be a Kyokushin one or two in like far from each mm -hmm. other, but they'll be there, and you'll see like, oh, okay, it's it's there. Fair enough. Yeah, I know New York has a high concentration, like the city and stuff, but outside mm -hmm. of the city, it's sporadic, and you don't know what you're going to find, unfortunately. That is so true. Like, it's really mm -hmm. crazy, like, how it just – it's like – it is, yeah, as you said, sporadic. That's the key word, so. What I found is, I guess, the intensity of it is not as appealing. I mean, it got me right away. Like, this intensity is awesome. Unless you have that same type of drive, it's – I guess it's off-putting to some people, and with mm -hmm. all the other mixes of martial arts, like, again – it's almost become uh, gravitating towards kids, the general martial arts schools in general, not to say Kyokushin, but it almost has that stigma now that, oh, you, my kid does karate, my kid does taekwondo, and it's almost more reserved for a younger audience. And then the adults, jujitsu is huge. There's a jujitsu school like around every corner. I could name like one in, or two in every town. So that's definitely seems more appealing for the adult population. If you want to start doing kickboxing, Muay Thai is the other one. A lot of these jujitsu schools do Muay Thai as well. So it seems like they're more interested in, I guess, the popularity of jujitsu and Muay Thai through the UFC. It's definitely been more popularized, especially in American culture. And that's a bigger draw for the adults. And I guess it's also a lot of people who do pursue those are looking for more careers or want to try to do some amateur fights or they find they those that pursue it are looking for more i guess the popularity of mma fights or kickboxing fights and kyokushin again since it's not so popular people aren't as so much looking to become kyokushin fighters and even personally i look at kyokushin from a different perspective that while you're doing muay thai and jiu-jitsu a lot of those guys want to go and become like a world champion Kyokushin with the whole karate embodiment of it, it's more of a personal journey. Like how far can you push yourself where like you can go to tournaments, you test yourself in a tournament, but the end goal isn't to be making money as a Kyokushin fighter. It's to really kind of push yourself to see what you can do. And I guess it's a different kind of mentality between pursuing a karate based art like Kyokushin compared to trying to be a kickboxer. Oh, that's very interesting. It's very true. Yeah. Like UFC has made Muay Thai much more, uh, pop uh give me one second uh yeah that's very true and so yeah that's very true so that's uh, so basically yeah that's very true with the muay thai being popular because honestly it's it's like you know you see the elbows the art of eight limbs and it's crazy but then you know people go there and i and then you, when they do a kyokushin class they have to be aware of only the the traditions and the katas and then they're like oh i thought i was signing up for action but there's other aspects it's not just hitting pads like muay thai and that might not be for some but 
I think it's very important to to keep tradition in there because that mm-hmm. you can keep tradition, but you have to find a way to modernize tradition. Yeah, I'm all for that. Actually, even my class, we have very intense warm ups and extreme like cardio conditioning drills. We're always doing bag work, partner drills, but then. I like to use like, and then we start doing basics and kata almost as like on the come down. Once you're all tired out, mm-hmm. now we're going to focus, relax our brain, go into doing the katas then, doing the basics. And it's really, it's like, it's a whole experience in itself, like, I guess is the best way to put it. Right. All right. That makes sense. Yeah, no, it's very true. Cause like some people are cat are cat are like, they like the kata. Some just like the, the hard warm ups, and some like competing. That's, that's just what it is. That's why it, there's different aspects of why we do Kyokushin. Um, when you said you did ITF, so there's two kinds of Taekwondo that that's something I wanted to ask you. ITF seems like the more kind of like a Kyokushin style in a way where it's much more full contact and the WTF, they do wear the pads. They do. It's more Olympic. It's more like Olympic recognized. I don't know. There's like there seems to be a difference between the two. Maybe you can there actually. I probably should have mentioned that too. So actually, after college, I started doing WT Taekwondo. I got hired to teach by a local WT school and started moving to the ranks. Actually, I have a third don in WT, the Olympic style karate or Taekwondo currently, and I teach that for mainly kids and I teach primarily adults for the Kyokushin as like a club. But yeah, there is a very big difference I noticed. So the ITF growing up, actually, I kind of had the opposite experience. It was mm-hmm. a lot more control based, like all technique and the fighting at the time. I'm not sure. I, mean, I think the rules may have changed after the turn of the century, but up until like 1999, it was just light contact point fighting. Like you would score a point, match stops, point back and forth. WTF or WT World Taekwondo used to be WTF. They actually, while they wear the chest protectors and arm pads, it's nonstop continuous fighting, like kickboxing and, um, I guess more so where you're just nonstop kicking, full contact, hitting the hogu, headshots, et cetera. The difference comes in that there's no light kicks. And because you have the chest protector, it's more, um, again, you're trying to rack up points, but in a con- consecutive series in a uh, non-stopping setting. So I guess is the best way to say it. So, I mean, I do like WT Taekwondo, especially for kids. I think mm-hmm. it's good that they're all padded up. They get to learn how to kick. They learn how to not pull their kicks. Like I've grown up doing the ITF Taekwondo. I found it was kind of inhibitive at times where it was all about control where you're trying to stop towards somebody's face and not go through so it almost makes you have a habit of having so much control that you're not going through the target whereas wt taekwondo kyogashin and kickboxing etc the point is to keep hitting and actually getting a semblance of realism out of the fight to an extent makes sense mm-hmm. that makes sense yeah so that's uh so that's that makes sense it's that so it's very good to exper- to explain the differences because we see it and it could confuse, but at least you experienced it. You've understood it. Um, you know, so obviously, you know, you're, so you were with Shia and, Ro, Shia and Roman Herman. You guys were with Shin Kyokushin, but Roman did leave and, you know, he's doing his own thing. So what's his, so what is his style now? Is he just trying to do his interpretation of Shin Kyokushin or is it basically just Kyokushin, but he wants to run, do his own thing, basically? It's more, I guess he just kind of wanted to run his own type of program. So I guess as far as, I'm again, I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of the larger mm-hmm. organizations. He That's wanted fine. to definitely be a little bit more independent. And so he ended up just creating, he calls it Kyokushin USA. So KUSA is his branch and he's got a couple other schools throughout the states of like uh, associations, I guess would be the best way to say it, of people that are under that same banner. So it's a very small scale organization, but I think the main thing is to kind of be more independent. He's very focused on basic technique. He really wants to make sure that the old school techniques are preserved. So he's really a uh, fundamentalist in many aspects of really trying to harp on singular basics, making sure that the technique is like the, to him, like the building block of all the Kyoko shit. So that's what he really focuses on with his organization. But again, no ill will. And even before Shin Kyoko Shin, he was with uh, Shihan uh, Monaco or Shihan Monaco with the uh, IFK for many years. He was their fight coach actually way back when. And uh, he's still on very good terms with uh, Shihan Shanker, Shihan uh, Monaco. And actually I, I, we always participate and support his events. Atlantic City every year, Shihan Shanker and the organization is always putting on a great tournament at the Tropicana over in Atlantic City. So we're always down to support them. We go there. Anytime yeah. they have events, we try to make our way up to New York. And so again, through the organizations, I think I, that's the other thing I like about the independence of Shihan Roman is that he is very open to don't let an organization stop you from expanding and networking with other places and so we were more than happy to support Kyokushin dojos and schools from all over and that's what we like to try to do that's awesome no that's all that's really really good to hear now also you're an author and you're also an artist of uh japan of of japanese 
cultural images. And so how did you get into that? And how's that like been for you in your journey as a martial artist? So actually, uh, that happened a lot during the shutdowns. So actually, mm -hmm. I'm actually an elementary school teacher as well. So I mean, during the shutdowns, okay. I had more downtime in between all the hybrid classes, et cetera. So in my spare time, I actually started authoring. And then I found a passion of wood burning, doing all these Japanese images. So I guess starting with the wood burning, what happened was I would always see all these awesome like dojos. They have like the kanji, like into the wood. I was like, I wonder if I can make something like that. So I ended up getting like a piece of wood, a wood burn tool. First thing I did was actually a Kyokushin kanji symbol. I was trying to just make one for myself, just personally. I was like, I wonder if I can do it. Made like a cool stencil, did it. I'm like, this came out pretty cool. I wonder what else I can start wood burning. So then I started being, again, with all the Japanese culture involved with the martial arts. I've always been a big fan of like the Japanese tattoo art, those Hana masks, Tengu masks, et cetera. And so I ended up getting like a uh, tattoo flashbook with some of those images of like, the Japanese uh, icons. Started making stencils, started doing those. And I'm like, these are coming out pretty cool. And I just started like, mass producing them in my spare time and ended up doing like a craft shows and like doing a martial art tournament setting up stands and booths and people ended up enjoying them they would come and pick up a couple pieces and actually i started moving onto some bigger work where um udagawa kuniyoshi he was like a ukiyo-e artist back in like the 1800s in japan always made phenomenal like woodblock prints all those have received those japanese traditional prints he's a particular artist i am a big fan of uh, i started just trying to do some of his pieces. And actually, I started doing a whole series, what actually made him very popular. It was called, um, if you ever read the book, The Water Margin, it's a Chinese classic back from, it takes place during the Song Dynasty. It was introduced to Japan, and it's a great story about 108 bandits. They are all trying to like um, stop corruption. Lots of battles and martial arts within the book in itself. Uh, he and, so Udagawa Kuniyoshi, ended up started making a whole series of all the characters from the book. And a lot of these characters had like tattoos, back tattoos and all these crazy tattoos. Mm -hmm. So he's drawing all these things. So in Japanese, uh, in Japan at the time, they saw all these prints of these guys with tattoos on the back. And like, that looks awesome. I want one of those. So it actually started a whole subculture of Japanese tattooing where a lot of these ukiyo-e uh, printmakers, so they would actually have those the spiky tools to like carve into the wood blocks. A lot of them became tattoo artists to fill that demand. So they would use the same tools for the wood blocks and start tattooing people. So there became a very cool like uh, integration of the culture of the block prints with Japanese tattoo art. And again, if you see martial artists, it's becoming more and more popular these days, all the Japanese tattoos. So I think there's definitely a cool cross between the history of Japanese uh, art, Japanese tattoo culture, and you're seeing its prominence in martial arts these days. So what I started doing is I'm trying to recreate the whole series of Udagawa Kuniyoshi. So even those 108 characters, he made 74 of them, but I, I know I wish, he, I wish he completed the whole series, but I'm trying to create those same 74 to start kind of doing like a cultural discussion. So almost like kind of have them on display, talk about the culture related to the arts. And I say, I have an example right here. I'd be happy to show you. I kind of brought it up. So if you would like to see one of them. Yeah, of course. So actually, here's one of the guys, it's uh, Lu Tang from the series. So actually, you can see it right here. You can see how all the wood wow. burns. Yeah, so it was actually one of the uh, prints that he did. Again, I make like a stencil of it. I get my tool by hand, and I just kind of go and start detailing it all up. So this is one of, right now, 30. I have quite a way to go to like complete the 74 of them. But in my spare time, it's continued even past the shutdowns. That usually at nighttime, I have a lot of downtime after teaching them all full of energy after teaching so late. And so usually I'll spend like an hour or two each night just working on art pieces and go from there. But that's amazing. That's, that's amazing, man. That's a crazy talent to have. Like, honestly, I wish I was that artistic <laughs> like you. <laughs> that must take so much practice to do, but I mean, you've done it for so long. So it's like normal to you. They're pretty, again, it's become a routine of my day. It's, it's that wind down period. And you know what I mean? The passions have to be yeah. fit in the pieces. And again, because of, It muted you. Oh. oh, we lost him there for a second, people. Don't worry. Just something happened with the phone. So oh. can you hear me now? I'm, here, I'm hearing you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, a phone call. Of course, problem with the phone is a <laughs> random phone call popped up. But anyway, but um, yeah, as I was saying, it's um become part of the nice wind down routine of the day. I can kind of just do it to relax at nighttime. Mm -hmm. So it's become a fun passion.
Yeah. Speaking of this, this is something I'm going to start asking my guests because obviously we see what you guys do on social media, but as the saying goes, social media is just a highlight of what you're putting out there. But like, what's a wind down period for you? Like when you're not teaching, like obviously with that, you're the arts you're doing there, but what's other stuff you do? In my case, I build model kits if you've probably seen on my social media and also I play video games, but what's a typical like wind down for you when you want to just separate from everything to get your mind relaxed? Um, usually it's just kind of watching TV, I guess. At the end, of I watch a lot okay. of kung fu movies. I mean, I kind of integrate <laughs> it with it. There's usually a kung fu movie on in the background as I'm doing the whole wind down period here. But I know anime is always good. My son, he loves watching anime. So even it's just nice to watch a show with him. So a lot of the wind down that when he's actually still up and it's not super late, we'll get to watch uh, shows together. And it, it's nice. Are you, is it is Crunchyroll you guys are using or Netflix for the anime? Well, usually Netflix, Hulu, whatever is really there at the time. I mean, okay. basically whatever we come across, we kind of just utilize. That makes sense. No, I'm. It's it's yeah. No, it's crazy. Like, do you let them watch even like the adult anime or as long as you're? Yeah, I usually have to screen whichever one that we're going first, and I'm like, oh, we're not ready to watch that one, bud. So usually we try to deter <laughs> some of the more inappropriate or graphic ones. So we try to stick with some of the older ones. <laughs> yeah, fun fact. I don't know if you remember with DirecTV. Remember the action channel they used to have for action movies back in the that day? That sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay, so when my dad got American Satellite, and I'll never forget this, so we obviously, American Satellite at the time was illegal in Canada, but mm. you know you could still get it somehow. And, my, and like, so we had Cartoon Network, but we had the Action Channel, and that's when I saw Akira for the first time. So every time my dad would walk by and like, there'd be like a gruesome scene, I just changed the channel. And then when he leaves, <laughs> I just change it back. It's like, so I was like 10 years old, and I'm like thinking to myself, I'm going to get in so much trouble if I get caught watching Akira at 10 years old. Yeah, some of them are pretty brutal. Like, it's, it's, I ended up getting like the, um, like growing up, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon okay. Ball was really the, the popular ones, whatever I could get on TV at the time. But I mean, I know TNT and TBS always had like the old martial art movies. So that's really what I was always watching. They always had like all the reruns of all the Bruce Lee movies, some of the old Kung Fu movies. I know um, like Chuck Norris back in the day, Van Damme. So they were like on like constant replay back in the 90s nonstop. So those were definitely a big draw. But... Oh, that's that makes total sense. I mean, we all grew up on Rocky IV, the Van Dams. <laughs> The Bruce Lee, the, the Michael Jai White, another one who seems mm-hmm. to be like, I know people know who Michael Jai White is, but it is kind of funny how like they don't mention him as much. I don't know why, but he's legit, man. The dude was Spawn, okay? He was the first, mm-hmm. he was Spawn. So, was just, and that's legit enough. Yeah, between him and even Dolph Lundgren, the both of them, I mean, from being in the Kyokushin community, which is only so big to begin with, especially over here, I mean, for them to have reached such levels in the acting world, they're very renowned. They're very skilled martial artists. It's, it's very impressive. Oh, they really are. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to see. So obviously, you know, you're you, when it comes to anime, you know, you got to screen it before to make sure your kid can watch it. So he's watching, let me guess, Pokemon, One Piece. I know you said Baki as well. He's, so not, he's not watching Baki. I, I've watched Baki. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Let's yeah, make... He's like, I, yeah, he's, yeah, Baki's a good one. I, I like the first season of Baki. It gets kind of a little off the rails for my own taste in the more recent yeah. season, but the first season was pretty good, but he's still not watching that one. That one's pretty brutal. One I'll really recommend to you. It's on Crunchyroll, um, but it's also on YouTube. Like some guy uploaded all the dubbed episodes. It's mm-hmm. Hajime no Ippo. It's a boxing anime. I okay. really recommend that one. If you got, it doesn't matter. Cause it, you'll, it's like, you'll just see like what it, it's like. You'll under, you'll relate to it. It's not like a typical anime. Mm-hmm. It's a really, it's like you really identify with the characters. So that's a one that, I'll really recommend to you. I appreciate it. I remember seeing like uh, posters of it, like around like random, like promos, like way back when I've never actually watched it. I will definitely check it out. Yeah. That reminds me of Megalo box. That, that first season, my son and I watched it. If you ever checked out Megalo box, that's another boxing mm-hmm. anime. Actually, That one was pretty good. The first season was interesting. My son liked that one, but. Good. No, that's awesome. It's really good to see that, that they're making some sports animes now that aren't like fantasy, like Dragon Ball Z. I'm not against it, but I mean, as you get older, you're like, Yes, it's timeless, but at the same time, I like realism. I like kind of realism in sports anime, you know, to, to you could really identify with it. So that's what's good to see now. They're making some, they're trying to do it. Well, that's my that's the reason why I really like watching anime with my son. Just the whole like the subculture in it is definitely about like perseverance, mm-hmm. training, trying to really motivate you to make something of yourself. So whichever the even the main plot is, that seems to be a general theme in most of them, which is why mm-hmm. I'm really supportive of usually watching those ones with my son. I definitely try to help motivate him or keep him on the right track with what he's watching. But that's that's really good. No, it's important because I mean it's it's like you don't want him going off watching the other stuff. It's, yeah. it's like you don't it's because I remember when I like when I rented uh Cowboy Bebop the movie from my mom mm-hmm. and my mom was like it's like 
all right. She goes, we're not watching this anymore, but I'll let you watch it this time. But then after that, like I got to watch whatever I wanted. So fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I gotta watch it right now. I watched the what is it? The uh, anime at, or the I'm sorry, the adaptation Netflix made of the okay. Cowboy Bebop. I, I liked it. I think it got a lot of flack. And they didn't renew the season. They were like, oh, it's terrible, and they stopped making. It. I thought it was pretty good, but that's just my own opinion. But it's very hard to make it real life compared to the anime because there is something that the loyalist of the show will always have to complain about, and they want to keep. They want it to be big, but then they're like, no, they like now you're entering our world because it's. I, that's the thing because when you start liking anime, and before if you used to trash on anime, like they remember, like they remember, and it's like it's like hey, it's like you said this was pretty weird and corny and childish, and now you like it, so I get it. Like I get it from both sides. It makes sense. And I guess also me, because I never really watched the original Cowboy Bebop. Yep. So I guess that's why it was more appealing, even though so. But I, I feel the same way with some of the other anime. The Veruna Kenshin remakes, like I'm not a big fan of their live remakes, honestly, but uh, with the actors. Like it's not, they're okay, but not as big of a fan. I, I love the original show. But. Uh, dude, the original is like, that's like goaded. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, you know, Shishio Makoto is like the greatest, isn't my top yes. three villains of all time. Like, Cause like, and it's like, it's like, I don't like, and I don't, and it's like the one time in an anime, I don't root for the hero. Cause like you understand, <laughs> she, you understand mm. Shishio's organization of why he, he is the way he is like, why, like how basically he was like a government, he was basically like used by the government. And then because he became too dangerous, they had to kill him. And he's mm. kind of, he's kind of that mix of Heath Ledger's Joker in anime. That's how I look at it. Cause he doesn't, he's very calculated but he's unpredictable, and that's what I liked about his storyline. Fair enough. No, no, that, that was definitely all the seasons of – they did a good job of ruining Kenshin and stopping when they did. Like Each season definitely had its merits, and the villains and the characters were pretty well developed in that one. I think the second season, because there was like the three seasons, the first one was good, but there was just a lot of fillers in between at times. But the second one, which was the, the Shishio story arc, which was the, the, the Meiji Restoration – that to me, for a second season in any anime series, it has got to be that's a blueprint of how to make an amazing second season. That's more dark. Uh, that's more dark. That shows more like the evils of, of humanity. That's what that's like. If so, when anyone's looking to make a series, that's the season you have to look at. Fair enough. No, that's 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 a good point. Yeah, you're right. The first season, a lot of anime start off kind of slow. Even like I, I love Bleach. The first few like ten episodes, like the introductory episodes, or a lot of them are like slow go, and then they really pick up as the seasons go on. But yeah, no, that's uh, that's really um, that's that's understandable. I've never gotten into Bleach. I know <laughs> I should. I know everyone's like, you gotta watch it. You'll really like it. Yeah, that one, yeah. especially for my yeah, especially for my son, that one's definitely on par with. Don't really have to worry too much about that one. <laughs> Although the new seat, they made a whole, they rebooted it or not rebooted, they're continuing it finally. It's on a who the thousand year blood war. That one is a lot more violent than the original one. They definitely are taking some more liberties with the <laughs> graphic content. It's pretty good so far. I'm, I'm behind a little bit on it, but I, I found the new one pretty good. So the thousand year blood war saga is pretty good. However, I mean it does take place right after it ended, so to catch up is quite a few episodes to go through there that makes sense that does make mm -hmm. sense and and obviously you know it, there's just so much to watch like and so much to read i'm collecting trading card games again like i have my Yu-Gi-Oh deck like i i'm not buying new cards don't worry i'm, I'm keeping my old warrior deck okay because I, I i spent years building that deck while well, the structure that came out and i got like one or two cards to make it and there's magic to gathering. I went to a Takuthon, which is like the anime convention in my city. And I'm sure oh. you guys have something too in New York, Philly, because it's like you guys are next next to each other. Mm -hmm. And it was just crazy to see like whether it's old or new, you you just get sucked in and you're it's like you're in a different world. Fair enough. I've never been to one myself. But I know they definitely have a, a, quite a few of those conventions, like sporadically, especially the major cities, like you're saying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So now that you know. Mm -hmm. You're training with Bob. Tell me what the goal is to do because Sensei Bob wants to see – what I love about what Sensei Bob is doing, he's trying to make a united front. Mm. I I have a way of using words, so it's not a bad thing, but he's trying to like unite those in USA Kyokushin, and it's really nice to see. So tell me like what that relationship has been like and what you're learning from him based on what he's doing. Um, so yeah, I'm not as familiar with um what is that uh, goals. I mean, it'd be nice to have. I'll have to have a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy to talk to. We've always been very supportive. Um, so actually, we ended up started connecting back through. I guess the USKA is the kickboxing okay. organization in Pennsylvania. Okay. That we like. I guess Bob used to 
I think he might have even competed in it. He was very uh, fr good friends with the owner of the organization. And actually, I ended up putting on a Kyokushin tournament back in 2018. It was regular kind of Kyokushin tournament. No head contact. It was more of a just kind of a one-on-one -on -one matchups, try to blow through the divisions. And he ended up coming out to Pennsylvania and brought some fighters. It was a great event. We ended up connecting there. And then um, we were kind of talk here and there sporadically. And then actually I started doing a, a new thing called uh, every six months I do the Ironman Kumite, where it's a kind nice. of, the, it's, it's a Kyokushin challenge more than anything else. So I kind of got the idea from like the hundred man Kumite. So the idea is you have one or one division, full knockdown, another division's semi knockdown. But this past one, we had a semi knockdown and a full knockdown. So he came and entered the full knockdown. So how it works is we had about 11 fighters. One, one person goes in the center, it's one minute rounds. So again, no head contact, more for like stamina building. You go toe to toe for one full minute. After that, you stay in, you fight the next guy. Then you fight the next guy and the next guy until you run through all the guys in the division. Then you're out, next guy goes in the center, runs through all the guys in the division. So it keeps going and going and going. So we had like three and a half hours of fights between the semi knockdown division and the full knockdown division. Bob came out and supported, did great. Everybody had a blast. So the whole thing I was trying to do with that event is it's not trying to be malicious. Again, as I was trying to say with, um, the whole point is a personal development. So the reason I just opted for no head contact was I really want you to stay in there and see what you can do. Can you stand toe to toe and back to back rounds? Can you complete the challenge? It's not about trying to knock out the person. It was more about trying to push the person. Can you keep giving them a run for their money, but also not try to just take them out of the rotation and just destroy the guys like by knocking them out. So the whole thing was, can you go 10 rounds and just stand there with somebody again and again and again and so i've been trying to do this i think we were on our third one we have another one probably coming up in march but again the whole concept is trying to build that camaraderie we're not there to compete against each other which again a lot of time i mean i love competition definitely good for your own like seeing what you can do but the purpose of doing this is not a competition it's to build that camaraderie in the Kyokushin community i want people to come i want you guys to fight with each other again and again and again and then you kind of network and talk so the whole point was to really create this difficult challenge and again it was great having sensei bob a lot of other people came from out we had shion mercado out from the poconos brought some guys from his dojo last time shion shanger sent a couple of his guys over our second one which was great so it's definitely a nice way to really connect and bring all these other dojos together for periodic meetings without a uh, any animosity or at least or hopefully no, that's really good. And I think that's what we're seeing now because I think our generation is the younger one. I mean, I'm an, I'm a I'm a millennial. I mean, Bob's a Gen Xer, but he's got the mindset of a millennial Gen Z -er in terms of like networking and then uniting. And I think it's really nice to see now because even my organization, which is Nakamura, we're trying to get everyone like we're doing like our friendship tournament in December and oh. all organizations are, are welcome. And it's just kind of nice to see that everyone's like we lost two years due to COVID. And time's ticking. So it's mm -hmm. really nice to see now we're trying to put everything aside and just find a way to collaborate on tournaments together. Definitely. Again, I'm really a big fan of everybody doing an events and trying to support the events. I think that's the best way to build community. Just keep putting out events and make it an open invite. And hopefully people can have that friendly demeanor when going. Like I said, there's a line between being vindictive, et cetera, that can, and also that's where people end up not getting along. I'm hoping that people I'm noticing more and more are a lot more friendly. They're a lot more welcoming. And we're trying to create those atmospheres by putting on all these different events is definitely a good way to try to build that community. And especially, like I said, Kyokushin is not big out this way. The only way really to grow is to network and keep putting these events on and making it into something. Oh, yeah, that makes so that makes so much sense. What's your take on this on a karate combat? I want to get your opinion on it because it is growing. But when you watch it, what are your honest thoughts on it with, with, with the kind of rule set they have and the styles of karate that are fighting? I um I love that karate is making a comeback, whether or not again, I'm not a huge fan of some of their rules, but again, I do like that it is a full contact version of karate. I believe it's at least bringing some respect back to karate in like the mainstream media. I mean, Baz Rutten being a person who's standing behind it is awesome that it's getting the support from some of these guys who have built a great reputation over the years. So as far as keeping karate, trying to break again, like I said, that association that karate seems to have, at least in the States of being just for kids, is trying to break I guess that stigma to an extent of that, hey, you can be a full contact fighter and enter these rings and put on these great shows and monetizing it for its fighters. I think it's great that it is, um, again, giving karate some better name value of showcasing some of the more intense aspects of it. 
But again, as far as the rule set, I think, I mean, I love Chokushin for what it is. And again, of course, I'm biased there, but it's, um, again, I think it's good for what it is. You know what you're signing up for. They can still put on some entertaining fights. Is it? This, I mean, again, as a growing organization, too, it'll take a little bit of time to get certain caliber of fighters of who you're trying to draw from, I guess, to put on even bigger spectacles. But again, I stand behind that they are actually making a good effort of putting these out there and, um, yeah, putting karate on that level of more intense combat. That's awesome, man. No, that's really, really good to see. And other, and that's, yeah, it seems that like they're trying to, it'd just be nice to see more Kyokushin fighters because when you go on their website, it's a lot of Goju Ryu, American <coughs> Kempo, Shotokan, and they have Kyokushin fighters, but there's just not many. And I guess they kind of, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe because we're not as well marketed, I don't know, but I, I don't have an answer to that. I'm not going to ask any questions. But I thought Boz Rutan, correct me if I was, wasn't Boz Rutan a Kyokushin guy at one point? Yeah, or like he, an he yeah. was. And then they have George St. Pierre there who's a Kyokushin guy, yeah. but I don't know why they're not speaking enough about the style. I mean, I don't, it's, it's a style of karate because we're the youngest style, maybe. That's, that's, it could be, I don't know, but I know, um, I don't know, like, as I was saying, maybe again, trying to be a pro fighter, but at the same time, that's my personal point is it's more for personal development. But I know there's tons of people who are fighters who want to go pro. And so I'm sure there's definitely a market in the Kyogishin community of those who want to take it to another level. And I think that would be a good next level at the same time the rule set may not appeal to some kyokushin guys while you now they have the face punches they take out some of the other parts of the arsenal that they are good at again i'm not sure what's deterring other kyokushin people from entering but um yeah i think the kyokushin guys that really want to make like a profession out of it would do pretty well and i know kyokushin over in europe is pretty i think is it uh i forget the name of the organization it says maybe senshin it's senshi. A, one of those that, yeah it's senshi. senshi yeah senshi they're putting on pro fights they're, they're, they're putting people together to do kyokushin rule fights muay thai rule fights combining so they're doing a good job over their way of really trying to make kyokushin they co compete with muay thai and kickboxing so they really are doing some pretty cool things there with what um yeah again trying to really build up that community and the draw of karate but again it really comes down to uh, what you're trying to do which tying back to one of the books i wrote actually it was called intent the path of the warrior so the whole point i wrote this book was similar questions like this like what are you trying to do in martial arts like do you want to be a pro fighter if you want to be a pro fighter what kind what are you going to do to make it happen for instance kyokushin you're a kyokushin fighter and you're training in kyokushin if you're trying to compete while kyokushin in itself is a complete set you have the katas with the face punches you drill face punches when you're really training for kumite you're training specifically for a kyokushin kumite so if you just throw a guy who's been training for kyokushin kumite into a muay thai fight you're going against somebody who's training specifically for muay thai so i mean the odds are already not in your favor not to say that kyokushin won't work you're just the probability is you're going against a muay thai guy and a muay thai rule set when you're training for kyokushin conversely with any style you can say the same thing you throw a Muay Thai guy into a Kyokushin fight, which I see very frequently, and they can stand pretty well. But again, you're going against a guy who's now got no gloves. You're not used to the no gloves, so the intensity is different, and it's a different type of fight. So again, are you trying to be a spectator fighter, become a kickboxer? And if you want to be a Muay Thai fighter or an MMA fighter, you have to train accordingly for those rule sets and really dedicate the majority of your training to do that. Are you training, again, like I said, for a personal challenge, in which case, be happy with what you're doing? Or right. do you not want any of this contact? And like again, I have as much as I don't like point fighting personally, I do see the merit styles like Shotokan and everything like that. They're very you're doing full body workouts, just training the katas, training the training the techniques, and then even the idea of a sport technique for self defense purposes. All you need, bop, you hit a guy in the face in a self defense situation, and then run away. I mean, you're not trying to prove anything in a street fight. So for self defense purposes, if you're just like, oh, don't hit me, bam, hit the guy, run away, it serves its purpose. So again, what are you trying to do? With the martial arts do you want to be able to have a better sense of self-defense you want it for your health do you want to become a kickboxer do you want to just compete for fun what are you trying to do and really you have to ask yourself that rather than become so defensive like of uh we have to become less defensive of our arts compared all these my art has this at least my art has that just be happy with your art and be proud of what you're doing rather than you shouldn't have to feel like you have to compete with other arts and that they all have their own merit be happy with what you do and know why you do it i guess is what i'm trying to say no that's very very true it's uh it's like you can't be like saying what's better every art has it's a bit it's based on the practitioner it's not the art like i've seen i've seen i've seen like black belt taekwondo beat 
successful Muay Thai guys. I mean, it has happened even. And then there's Muay Thai guys that beat Shotokan guys. And then there's the Kyokushin guy that will beat the, the Taekwondo guy. It's just really subjective. It's how skilled is the practitioner with what he or she knows going into a fight. Yeah, and again, what kind of fight do you want to do? And if you want to do that kind of fight, train accordingly for that type of fight, I guess. So awesome. No, it's very, very true. Justin, um, what are your plans now for the rest of the year and going into 2024? Because this year has been like a reopening of sorts of everything. So what, and you did the art, you did your kumite and also your meeting with like Shanks, Shanker, Sensei Bob, and amongst others. So what's the net, the plan for the rest of 2023 looking like for you? Um, so right now I'm trying to really get my guys ready for January. So now that the summer is over, usually by October, we really start cranking up the uh, training for the Atlantic City tournament. So again, that's like now the IFK, like United States, or like East Coast Championship. So we really want to make sure our guys are ready from that. So we're going to really start just bamping up training, making sure my guys are ready in terms of Chokushin. And then in conjunction to that, all my other projects still stand. I mean, my wood burns is a constant hobby. So it's going to be keep on going. Uh, there's a couple other smaller tournaments. You like to support all the local tournaments. Like there's a Tang Sudo one coming up and a Shotokan one coming up. While my guys probably won't do any of the Kumite, we always yeah. try to have them encourage them to go p- compete in the open forms division. We like to support the local tournaments, go out there. So definitely as like a secondary, just kind of go, go do your form and kind of see what happens just to really kind of encourage people to stay in like that competition mindset. But the primary focus is definitely uh, the Atlantic city tournament supporting the Kyogoshin community. And then springtime again, we'll have another Iron Man, and then it just repeats. So as we try to keep it re- in repeat, so we got again, every January is Atlantic city, March and Iron Man, August and Iron Man. And that's just a constant cycle. And then in between doing what we can. Awesome, man. Well, hey, Justin, Sensei, I want to really thank you for coming on the show. So glad we got to do this. You're a man that's very cultured. Where can people connect with you if they want to see what you're doing? Because you're doing so much. Well, I appreciate it. Instagram is probably the best way to get me. It's Kyokush in Philly. You can definitely find me right there, Kyokush in Philly. It kind of lists all the things I'm doing is definitely what you want to do. Or if you ever just want to shoot me an email, Philly at gmail.com. If you have any specific questions, they can reach out whenever. Awesome. I want to say thank you for taking the time. I had so much fun doing this. Keep up the amazing work and I love it. So keep it up and and I'll, and I'll if I have any animes, I'll make sure to recommend them to you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> no problem. Guys, make sure to hit the like, share, subscribe button to, to Kyokush and Philly. Follow them if you like to see what they're doing. And if you like this conversation, make sure to hit the like, share, subscribe button to the Drew Spirience. We're on all platforms, but focused on YouTube for now, only as mentioned. But may, but nonetheless, I'll make sure to put the great con these converse these. I can't talk today. It's Sunday. I'm sorry, but I'm still here. I I will make sure to put the best content out as possible. If you enjoy these conversations on martial arts, the values of it, and just pop culture and martial arts. So everyone have a great day. Justin, thanks once again. And you have yourself an amazing one. Oh, you as well. Thank you. Thank you.